All right, so, so far in Django, we've covered how to run get requests to grab information out of our database. And that's been great, but so far, or as we saw yesterday, we made a change to all of our Pokemon. And when we made that change to all of our Pokemon, all of our Pokemon got the wrong kind of type, right? We got here that they're normal for every single one of them. And if we wanted to update them, uh, we should have the user freedom to actually send a request to update this data. We shouldn't do it ourselves manually through our through our actual database or through some sort of SQL script. So instead, we're going to utilize API endpoints that users can send different types of requests to to be able to update this information. So in part one, we'll be covering what is CRUD, CRUDing API design with status codes, why request body instead of URL parameters, implementing the put method, testing the put view, writing the post method, writing the delete view, and then testing both the post and delete views. At this point, does anyone have any questions over what we'll be covering today? All right, if no one has any questions, I would uh, just a friendly reminder to please send any questions that you have during the lecture through the Whiskey Questions channel, or just simply raise your hand and I will address you as soon as I can. All right, awesome. Let's take a look at our curriculum here. And what we're gonna cover real quick is not necessarily what is CRUD, uh, but these CRUDs stand, and this CRUD's in the API design as far as status codes go. So CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete. So far, we've done the read method. That's just simply running a get request to grab information out of our database. We can see here that we have the different purposes of the request, their coordinating methods, and their coordinating response. This chart right here is coming from two scoops of Django. Um, if you wanna take a look at their API design section and status codes, this is in there. So we can see that when you create a new resource, that should be a post method. It should insert something into the into the database in SQL, and the response should be a 201 created. If we're reading something, we should get a 200 success or 404 not found if there's nothing there. If we're sending an update to an existing source, then we should get a 204, which stands for no content. There's nothing in the response. Or a 200 if we are returning something within the response. I tend to lean towards the 200 side because I would like to return the updated body back to the front end or the user. Uh, but you could definitely do a 204 and just have the user running a request or assume that because they got the 204, they should update it on the front end without pinging the, uh, the back end server again. And then we have delete an existing source, which is a delete request. It should delete something from our database and that should return a 204 now content. It's not, uh, you'll see it in other APIs for that, that they'll return 200 success, uh, but the standard is to return 204 no content. And we'll see these status codes, where they come from and how to implement them once we start working with our different views. Currently, if we go over to Django and I send this request again, so if I just refresh it, we can see my request was processed and it returned a 200 success status code. We can also see it here on the Django REST framework portal. I get a HTTP 200 okay. I got, I sent a get method to get this information. At this point, does anyone have any questions regarding status codes or the HTTP methods that we'll be utilizing today? All right, there doesn't seem to be any questions. So let's go into the next portion here. So why would I want to build request.data or why would I want to use request.data or the body of a request in order to receive arguments? Well, currently we're talking about updating my Pokemon. And if I wanted to update specific fields of my Pokemon, that means I would have to do something such as where I enter a query param so I say, hey, here are my query params. Um, my name is going to be equal to, uh, 
Pikachu. And then I could say, and my level will be equal to 35 now. And et cetera, et cetera, right? I would build an entire URL pattern that would be able to accept each one of these queries. Another way to do it would be I could pass them as URL parameters, right? I could say name slash, and then I could say string. Here's where the name that I want to update would go. I could say level slash, and then integer. Here's where the level representing this level, this new level would go to be able to update it. But I would have an entire one that would have a huge URL pattern to be able to accept each one of the, these arguments. And two, each one of these arguments would be exposed every single time a user makes a request. And that's not necessarily what I want. It's also just not very efficient as far as controlling the data that's being sent throughout your request. If we think about it in this case, how would I send my request to Axios in a more efficient manner? So, so far we've only been working with get requests and we haven't really seen how to build the body. Um, but we've seen issues with just this entire URL pattern function. So that's where request body comes in. Rather than passing each individual argument through the URL patterns, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build a body or send a body within a request that I can grab within my API views. So what does that look like? Let's go ahead and take a look here. If I go into Thunder Client, and I open up my current request here. I'm just gonna move it that way. All right, and I open up my current request that I have. I can go ahead and ping my Pokemon. And when I send that request, we see that it comes back through my, uh, that my request was received and everything went through. Well, let's open up this API view and take a look at what's going on. All right, so here's my API view. It looks like I wrote an example of what we would want here. All right, we're sending it Pokemon. <laughs> but let's uh let's actually print the request here. Let's print request. All right, when I send this request again, we can see that this is a rate framework, a REST framework request. If I wanted to take a look at the headers, I can still access headers. If I send this, we can see we get a dictionary that's holding all of the headers of the request, including where the user ate, where this uh, request is coming from. It's coming from Thunder Client, running on my local host, and it looks like the connection is closed. So the connection isn't maintained, it's just one time. All right, well, that's my headers. What if what other useful information can I find inside of request? Well, if I try to access user, it tells me, hey, this is an anonymous user. I have no idea who this is. There's no, we don't have any authentication method just yet. So this is just a random person thing in your API. That's good, that's what I expected. But what if I do request.body? If I send it to request.body, I get this binary string with an empty body. Now, here inside of our Thunder client, we can see that there is a body portion. Now I have an example on the left-hand side of what this would look like with, Ax with Axios. If I were to send this request through Axios, I'm placing a dictionary at the end of my URL pattern. Well, this object, excuse me, this is JavaScript. So this object that I'm sending is what would get interpreted as the request body. So how do I mock that using Thunder Client? I would go over to the body tab. And in the body tab, we'll see that it opens up a small portal here. You can choose which form you want to send it with. We're always going to utilize JSON with Django. Now I'm going to go ahead and open up an object. This object will have the key of name and the name I want to pass is Charizard. All right. So now when I send this request, 
we'll see that my body or my binary string is now printing my object name Charizard. So request body is passing in that object. Typically, we would utilize JSON.loads to be able to turn this into a Python dictionary that we can actually work with. But as we saw when we printed request on its own, this is known as a REST framework request. So here we go. Here is a REST framework request. It was a get to API slash v1 slash potent. Well, that gives us the ability to utilize something called request.data. And what request.data does is it takes the body of the request and turns it into a Python dictionary or Python code. So now I'm actually able to interact directly through this code in Python. And this is just a dictionary. I can utilize the dot get method to pull out the key of name. And if I send my request one more time, we can see that it only pulls out Charizard. If I were to change the name here to, uh, let's go with, I don't know. And I pass a default argument to dot get, then I'll see default being printed. If I don't pass in the default and I send my request, I get none. Now, it's very common for people to try to utilize square brackets to grab things out of a dictionary. And I understand the reasoning behind that. We've also seen it quite a bit throughout our curriculum and throughout the pull hub. But please, when you're designing your API, try to utilize dictionary methods to grab values out of the dictionary, such as dot get or set value. Um, any of those arguments would be better because as you all know, if I didn't have the key of name within my dictionary and I passed it, well, now when I send the request, my API endpoint would break. And the only reason why it would break is because the key wouldn't be located inside of my API endpoint. Sure, I could have a try and accept, but that wouldn't necessarily be the correct format that I want. Instead, I would want to grab the key of name and then do some sort of assessment afterwards to make sure that grabbing the key of name was successful, that it exists within the request. And if it doesn't, then there, I would just avoid doing any sort of behavior in this case. And that's request.data, interacting with the body of the request. Does anyone have any questions over how we utilize request.data or why we choose to send information over request.data rather than through URL parameters? All right, it doesn't seem like there are any questions. So let's get moving into our actual API endpoint. So, so far we have this all Pokemon and this all Pokemon should interact with all of our Pokemon. So that's not necessarily where we want to update information, all right? Currently Pikachu has the wrong type to attach to a normal. That's not what I want. I wanna be able to send a request where Pikachu gets updated to have the correct types, level, name, or maybe even add some moves. So let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna say DF put passing self request an ID. This is going to respond to a get method. And I could copy and paste this information here for grabbing a Pokemon. All right, so I say copy and paste, but now I have repetitive code for being able to grab a Pokemon. Um, what's the problem with that? What is it? Is this good design? Should I have repetitive code or what can I do to avoid having this repetitive code? Create a function. Nice. Yeah. I could separate this information and have a method within my class named get a Pokemon. And this would take in self. The ID. And now what I can do is grab the Pokemon.
All right, so that will grab a Pokemon and return that Pokemon object. So now when I say Pokemon in other functions, I can just say self dot get a Pokemon and pass in the ID. And I can do the same thing here. Pokemon, oh. Self dot get a Pokemon and pass in the ID. Now I could manually go and change each one of these methods. I could write an if statement to account for each one of these methods or each one of these fields to make sure that I'm getting the correct information. But my serializer is actually super powerful in that case. My serializer is able to upload or update information if I truly want it to. I need to pass in a read only argument to the serialization method. Now, the reason why I need to make sure that that exists is because if um, essentially when this tries to serialize data, if it tries to serialize data that is connected to another serialized field, it's going to expect you to give it some sort of primary key or connection. And Django REST framework doesn't like to handle update methods in that way you would have to handle update methods as far as relationships manually. Well, now I want to make sure all of the information is able to get updated. So rather than having these fields, I'm just gonna go ahead and do underscore underscore all to ensure that it grabs all of my fields within my serializer. All right, let's make sure I didn't break it. If I send my request over to Pokemon, I still get all of my Pokemon. But now I have all of my fields. I could see all of their information. So now let's continue with our view. Well, how do I update this Pokemon? Well, for now, let's just return a response saying this is updating. And let's go ahead and say, data is equal to request.data.copy, making a copy of the dictionary in request.data. Then I'm gonna print data. Now, why would I wanna make a copy of the data rather than just utilizing request.data? Can anybody think of a reason why I would wanna manually make a copy of this data? Go ahead, Donnie. Uh, would it be something like you don't want to like corrupt the like master data file or whatever? Yeah, that's great. So I don't want to actually interact with the user's data. I don't want to change the user's data because the user's data should be my source of truth, right? Whatever sort of formatting or changes I want to make should happen to a copy of it while still keeping the main data coming in intact. All right, so let's go ahead and send this information. Let's say that what we want to change is the types and we want to change this to electric. Well, now when I send my request, I'm going to send it to one. That should give me Pikachu. So we can see Pikachu was triggered. We got all of the information for Pikachu, but we didn't actually get that print statement. Why is that? Go ahead, Yams. Is this because we're still doing the get request? Right, I'm still sending a get request. So I'm interacting with the get method. I need to send a put request so I could interact with the put method. So now we can see the put method was triggered. I made a copy of the data. And when I print data, I get types electric. Great. Well, now, how does my serializer update this information? Well, now I can say update Pokemon, make this equal to my Pokemon serializer. The original Pokemon will be my first argument. My second argument that I want is data equals data. So this is the data that my serializer will use is the incoming request data. 
or the copy of the incoming request. And then I'll say partial because I'm not passing every single field is true. Now let's take a look at update Pokemon. Now, when I send my request, this came back true. I can get a char field. Oh, I apologize. I got everything in here, but I didn't actually get the information. I need to do dot data. Well, now when I send my request, it's telling me, hey, you can't run dot data because it's a representation. You have to run is valid first. All right. Very well. Then let's run that. Let's say updated Pokemon dot is valid. And let's actually print that to make sure that that comes out to be true. We send our request. We can see that it is a true set of data. And now let's print update Pokemon dot data. All right. So now if I take a look at Pikachu, we can see that it came back to be true. Here's my serialized information. And we can see that types came out to be normal. Well, that's not, that's not what we wanted there. I wonder why, hmm, Pokemon data is this data. It could be because I haven't saved it. Let me go ahead and save it and then after, I'll go ahead and run this information again. Go ahead and do update pokemon.save and then print the data. All right, there it is. So I send the updated Pokemon. It came out to be valid. I saved the Pokemon data. And after saving the Pokemon data, I apologize to everyone. After saving the Pokemon data, we can see that in types, we have electric, All right? So just like that, I was able to get rid of having to do something like this. If I didn't have the power of serializers, I would have to say if data.get name, then Pokemon.name is equal to data.get name right and then i would have had to do it over and over again for all of the different um uh, all of the different fields that i have available and that's not what i want right this would be very inefficient that's not what i actually need i need a quick way to go about this and this is going to be my way of sending this information i'm going to update my pokemon through my pokemon serializer ensure it is valid so i'm going to go ahead and say if pokemon data is valid I want to save said Pokemon. I could print the updated data, but I mainly did that just to be able to see it. But now that it's safe, I can return a response where I have updated Pokemon data. And now that sends back my response. And if this isn't valid, then I could return my updated Pokemon dot error messages to my to my front end. So now I can say something like types, um, I don't know, no, oh. And if I send this request, why well, didn't get an error, right? I got a put method. It's still returning 200 response, but now it gave me my error messages telling me, hey, this field is required. I'm not sure what field that is. And it says, no, this field may not be null. And then invalid. Invalid data is spec a dictionary, but got a dictionary type. All right. So there's all of the errors that came through. Unfortunately, there's not many messages. I would have to go into my serializer and alter my error messages so that they're a little bit more specific. 
as far as what information is coming in or I'm feeding back to the user. But now if I send electric, we can see that my put request came back 200 okay. Everything came back true. And now I can see that electric has been updated within my Pokemon. All right, that is the update request method. We created a method for getting a Pokemon because we saw that that was repetitive code where we get an object or send a 404 response. We then made a copy of the request.data that the user is sending. We update our Pokemon through the Pokemon serializer. And then afterwards, we ensure that data is valid. If it is, we save the data and return the updated Pokemon. Otherwise, we return a response, letting the user know that there has been an error. All right. At this point, does anyone have any questions? I see a question coming in from the chat from uh, Natalie. I don't get how changing the data uh, on Thunder Client works. How would this work in a real scenario? Yeah, that's a great question. So how could this work in a real scenario? So if I was sending this information through some sort of form, we already know a little bit of React, right? So let's go ahead and type this out. So let's say I had a form with a couple of use state functions and I have a use state for a Pokemon name and level and their description as well as their types. All right, so those are the use states and a user has a form that they can interact with to be able to change the values through these, these uh, variables. Great. Well, now, what does that look like when I make my request? Well, if I were to send a request of update Pokemon, I will say const update Pokemon is an asynchronous request. Just going to go ahead and comment all these out real quick so that I don't get that spacing error anymore. All right, and what I would send in this request is I would say let response be equal to await axios dot put. Now would be sending a put request to this URL pattern, which would know we know would bring back Pikachu, and what I would send within the body of the request would be the same dictionary that I'm sending within the body of Thunder Client. And that would be my function, right? I would send my update request. And then afterwards I would do something like handle the response and update the state of this one individual Pokemon. Does that answer your question, Natalie? Yeah, that makes a lot more sense seeing it that way. Thank you. Of course, no problem. Go ahead, Brian. Sir, in the um, in the JSON provided in the right pane, types electric types is plural, so shouldn't shouldn't you be able to pass in multiple values like inside of a list there? Like, wouldn't that be in brackets? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the reason why this isn't in brackets or the reason why types is just taken in a string is because that's the way I made my model. If I take a look at my model here on the right-hand side, I created types, but types is just a char field. Uh, you're right. I probably shouldn't have named it types in a plural manner because that does give the sense that it should be a pluralized statement. I should have named it just type, but I was trying to avoid um, getting some syntax error since we know that type function actually exists within Python. Does that answer your question, Brian? Yes, sir. It just reminded me that, that in moves in the serializer, it said read only true, but it didn't say many is true. And so I was wondering if you tried to update moves with like if that would even work instead yeah. of type. That's a great question. And let's take a look at our at our models here. So if we take a look at our Pokemon model, we are not accounting for moves. So in my serializer for a Pokemon. I am simply just telling it, hey, 
do we're not going to do a put method for this information. So there is no put method for uh, for moves. I can't update my moves through my Pokemon. If I wanted to update my moves, I would have to handle it separately. And actually, we have plenty of time to go into this. So let's do that real quick. Um, this would update my Pokemon data. Okay, so here within the request, I can go ahead and let's see. I think I would make a separate method saying update moves. That would take in self. A Pokemon. And a list of move IDs. Oh, oh no, that's right. Okay. So that would be my method. I would take in self, my Pokemon, and a list of move IDs. And what I would do here is say Pokemon dot, because this is a many to many relationship, I would say moves dot add. And I would probably utilize some of this comprehension here. Actually, let's say for move ID in list of moves ID. If move dot objects dot get, now we'd have to import moves now. where ID is equal to move ID. So if this is valid, then what I would do is say Pokemon.moves.add, and I would pass in the move ID. Um... I think I would utilize get object of 404 in this case because I would want them to know that there isn't a move that matches this ID. All right, so then I would make this method and I would trigger this method in here. So I would say if data.get list of moves. Then I would pass that information. I would say self dot update moves. I would pass in the Pokemon that I have with the new data. Uh, yep. And I would want to Pokemon dot save. Okay, so there's that. I would pass in the Pokemon, and then I would pass in the list of moves. All right, so I'm handling that separately, not doing it through my serializer. Uh, let me see if this will work real quick, because this is definitely in theory. Uh, let me take a look at all my moves. Send a get request. Okay, so I see I have Psychic, uh, Water Pulse. So let's say I just pass in two and three. Let's say list of moves. Make it two and three. All right, let's see. I'm not 100% sure this will work. So let's send this request and see what we get. This one will go to Pokemon slash one. 
I want to send a put request. We send it. Okay, looks like it worked. So now we got the moves. We got our name. We got our water. And we got slap. Um, this put method up here for updating a Pokemon moves, uh, you could change it to also remove moves if the move ID is already within your list here. So if it is, you will just utilize delete rather than add. And that's how you remove it from the set. Does that answer your question, Brian? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for demoing that. Of course, no problem. All right. So that's our put method. We've been able to change all of our information. We created a couple of methods for updating our Pokemon and getting our Pokemon more efficiently that we can reutilize so that we're not uh, repeating ourselves. And so now we have some nice centralized code. This right here could probably get cleaned up quite a bit. Um, and once you start seeing these gaps happening over and over again, or like indenting a little too far, that means you have something called a code smell. And it's essentially a sign that you could probably refactor this code to make it more efficient or to maybe take away some sort of if statement. Um, sometimes you just have to utilize some comp uh, some ternary statements, but you want to avoid having these in nested indentation blocks as well. But this is great. I have my put Pokemon, my put method. I'm able to update my Pokemon. Now let's go ahead and write a test for this information. And actually, before I move on into writing a test, I want to make sure that there aren't any other questions regarding the put method, how we're working with request.data, or how we created this method for updating moves. And actually, can I share a quick thought? Yeah, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, this the update moves is awesome. I just want to point out Something interesting to note is inside that if statement on line 44, we're saving twice. So it's unlikely, but not impossible. Like the non-move stuff we save successfully and maybe something goes wrong with updating moves and that doesn't get saved. Um, I think that's very unlikely, but it's always a good thing to keep an eye on is like if you're saving twice in what order that happens as stuff starts to get more complex. Those are, those are where like sort of edge cases can creep in. So just, just, I don't think it's immediately relevant, but I couldn't help, but I wanted to share the thought. And, and I agree, this is a great implementation and writing a, a helper method like that is definitely the way to go. Yeah, let's try it out. Let's see if we could break it. Let's uh, put a capture statement here. Make it false. Currently, capture is true. And let's say that we want to change my list of moves and put an invalid number in there, something like 15. All right, we currently don't have 15 moves, so I know that that move doesn't exist. So now if I send my put method, I get a 404 four, no, uh, no move matches found for this query. All right, great. So now let's see what happens when I send my get request to that one specific Pokemon. So when I send that one get request to that specific Pokemon, I can see the capture was updated to false. I still have my other two moves of two and three. It didn't throw an error until it countered 15. So it seems to be working the way we want it, but definitely uh, keep an eye out for that safe method as to when it's being triggered and what it's triggering. In line 45, what we're triggering is dot safe through our serializer, through the serializer data that we pass through. And the secondary save is actually happening through a manual save to the Pokemon object itself, not the serializer. Yes, yeah. and actually it's a great example of like robust design or defensive programming, how it works great. Like we have this edge case where the behavior is a little surprising, but there's no errors and, and data still gets updated and nothing bad like creeps into the database, which is really cool. Awesome. All right, so now we have our put method completely built out. It doesn't seem like there are any other questions from anyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and move into testing this said put method. Let's open up our test directory. Here we have my test views. I already have a client set up here. So now let's test updating our Pokemon. What will this look like? I'm 
I'm going to go ahead and start my test. So test 03, which is going to be update a Pokemon. And let's just say data, right? Ideally, I would want to do each individual field and test it out, but we don't got we don't have that amount of time. So let's run to testing it to be able to accept all of our data. So now let's go ahead and grab a Pokemon out of our database. So let's say that our Pokemon is equal to Pokemon. And we haven't imported Pokemon just yet. So this is going to give me yellow. Now I'm going to say where name is equal to, and in this case, I'm going to utilize Eevee. Let me import Pokemon. So from, I'm going to want to put there, from Pokemon app dot models import Pokemon. All right, I'm going to send this request to Eevee. What I want to happen is I want my client to actually send something here. So I'm going to say response is equal to self.client. My client is going to send a put request to a Pokemon. If I take a look at my URLs here, we can see that the name I handed to this URL path is a Pokemon. And actually I didn't specify reverse, so I need to make sure that I do that. So let's utilize the reverse function to ping our URL patterns through the name. And let's pass in the argument of Eevee. Um, let me make sure that my JSON data actually has Eevee within it. Pokemon data. Okay, so I do have Eevee within my Pokemon data. So there I am, I'm able to pass in Eevee. There was no need for me to create a Pokemon. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment that out for now to make sure I don't import unnecessary information. Uh, but now that I'm sending this request, I can also pass in a body. Oh, well, in this body, I could change types. Um, I could say that, well, Eevee is a normal, so I wouldn't change its type. Uh, well, for practical application purposes, let's do water. Um, let's do changing the capture status. I'm not sure what currently EV has. Let's see, capture is false, so let's make it true. And let's change the description. Uh, Eevee turns into Jolteon, which is better than Pikachu. All right, so there's my put method. My put method sends this request. It's going to grab the Pokemon named Eevee. It will update its types to water. It will update its capture to true, and it will update its description. All right. Well, most of the time, this is going to be more than enough, or at least what we've seen, this is more than enough. Right? But as we saw in the headers, when I send my request, my headers always tell my server, this is the kind of response that you're receiving. But when I'm creating a request through Django test, I have to specify that format. I have to tell it that the content type it will be carrying will be application JSON. This way it can compensate for some JSON syntax. And that's it. We have our request built out. Well, for now, let's do self.assert. And then currently there's been a Django update. So we have self.assert underscore. But in the testing framework, the update is self.assert true. Right? And what I want to assert is the same is my response content. So currently, oh, I didn't even cover my response content. I apologize. We'll go backtrack to that here shortly. 
So for now, I'm just going to go ahead and say true. And I'm going to print my response dot content. So there's my server. My server is running. If I kill my server and I run Python, manage py, test Pokemon app dot tests dot test views. All right, we can see that it ran a couple of tests. One failed. Uh, where is that failure? I see. So I updated my fixtures. And because I updated my fixtures, my answers have now been updated for this previous two tests. Uh, I'm not going to go about debugging that. I'm going to go ahead and send this test again to make sure this one is working. All right, so there's my body of my request. We can see that it's coming back. It's coming back pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and place this inside of answers. Oh, got it. I'm say update Pokemon is equal to, and there's my answer. We can see that I have a syntax error because it's doing JSON for true. So now when I go here into my test file, I can bring in update Pokemon, come back down to the bottom, and we're going to assert equals is I'm going to utilize body be equal to JSON dot loads. Now I want to make sure that the body is the same as my answer. So now I send my request and my test comes back okay. All right, so, so far we've gone over building our test. We've gone over building our view. At this point, does anyone have any questions over how I built this view or excuse me, how I built this test and how this test is passing in this body into the request? It should look pretty familiar. It's almost like Axios, right? It's just, uh, it would be Axios.put and with an async and await function. So all we're doing is building our Axios call put through type. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So I'm gonna backtrack here into our views. We're sending back a response, but we're never specifying any sort of status codes. Well, how do we do that into our views? We're gonna actually go to the very top of the file. And just like we imported all of this information from REST framework, the last thing that we'll need to import is from REST framework dot status. We're going to import a series of status codes. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring in success. We're going to bring in 201, create it. We're going to bring in 204, no content. And then 400 for a bad request. All right, so there's all of the HTTP responses that I'm going to, or the, the status codes that I'm going to bring in. I'm sending back content here. So I want that to return a 200. If I didn't have a body in my response, then I would return a 204. But I also want to make sure that this error message specifies that status codes will be HTTP 400, letting them know that they sent me a bad request. And that's what's triggering these error messages. All right. And that is it as far as the put method. All right, so let's do a quick overview over what we built out here. We started making a put method. We already had the URL pattern for this information or for grabbing a specific Pokemon, but we added a put method. 
We recognized that there was repeated code for being able to get a Pokemon. So we created a separate method that will return a Pokemon either by name or ID or throw a 404. Once we have said Pokemon, we made a copy of the request data. We then updated this Pokemon through our Pokemon serializer. And if we take a look at our Pokemon serializer, the only change we made was we turned our serializer method into a read only method. We then validated said data to ensure that this data is valid. We update that, oh, excuse me. We save that Pokemon to update its information within our database because currently it's not updated within our database. And then we ensure if there is a list of moves that gets passed, we can trigger this update moves method that we created, which will add moves into our Pokemon. And we could extend on this update moves and have it remove. I'm not gonna go into that because we're unfortunately running out of time, but know that this is where that logic would go. And then we return a response of that updated Pokemon with its data. Otherwise, if we throw errors through this is valid method, we will respond with the messages within this error dictionary and a status code of HTTP 400 bad request, letting the user know, hey, I do not have an internal server error. You're, you're just simply sending me a bad request. So HTTP 400, it's the user's fault. If it's a 500, it's my fault as a programmer. All right. At this point, does anyone have any questions over anything we covered over part one? Go ahead, David. Yes. Up in your update moves method, um, where it's passing the if get object or 404, and then it passes move. I was kind of confused. Could you explain um, what that's doing? Yeah, definitely. Um, this was this happened because of a question that was in regards to how we would update our list of moves. It's not within our serializer, so we have to manually create methods to update this many-to-many -many connection. So I don't want to just update moves to invalid moves that don't exist because Django won't be able to handle that. If I try to pass a ID that doesn't exist into that many-to-many -many connection or that many-to-many -many relation, it will automatically throw an error, all right? So I don't want it to just throw an error. I want it to actually tell the user, hey, this move doesn't exist. So I'm checking if there is a move that exists by doing this get object or 404. If a move does not exist, it will return a 404 response, letting the individual user know, hey, one of the moves for the IDs that you passed in doesn't exist. Um, so you're giving me invalid data, all right? And if it is successful and it grabs an object out of my database that matches the ID, then I would add that save that ID to the current Pokemon that I'm working with into its move set because moves is a set. And then I would save it. Um, that's what's going on in this portion. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. I was just uh, a little confused how you're passing move, like the move model, right? Oh, got it. Yeah, so the move model, I imported it here. And then you're just telling it to check the move model that it has that an ID equal to that move ID. Right, that there's an instance that has that ID. Okay, yeah, thank you. Of course. All right, any other questions? Go ahead, Adam. I had a minor one. Um, I think at when you imported the different HTTP response codes, did you wrap them in a parentheses in that import statement up top? I did, yes. Um, and I actually was just curious about that. I hadn't seen that before. Yeah, so the reason why I wrapped them in parentheses is so I could do this. Nice. Cool. Yeah, Thank so you. the formatting thing. Of course, no problem. All right, if there aren't any other questions, that's gonna conclude part one of our lecture. I'm gonna go ahead and pause our recording. Sure.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, before we left, we went over the put method and being able to send put request. But now we're going to go ahead and go over the second portion of our lectures. We're going to go over writing the post method and writing the delete method. And then we'll go over testing both of those views. So um, both of these views are actually going to be pretty simple. Um, and we've seen their functionality before when we were working through the Django shell. So with that said, where should my post method for creating uh, a Pokemon instance live? Should it live within all Pokemon or should it live within a Pokemon? Go ahead, Adrian. Would it be under all Pokemon? Yeah, great. It would be under all Pokemon. Now, um, I, I've heard the argument being made of, well, you're mate creating a Pokemon. Yes, I am creating a Pokemon, but the interaction that I'm having isn't with one specific Pokemon. Rather, it's an interaction that I'm having with the entire Pokemon model. Right? I'm not interacting with one instance in itself. I'm interacting with the class. So I'm going to go ahead and make my post method to my all Pokemon model. So I'm going to make the uh, post self because it's a class. And I'm going to pass in pass. All right. So I'm passing in post self and pass. But this is uh, this post method is supposed to accept something else as an argument. What else does post accept? Or does any API method accept? Go ahead, Jens. Uh, request for the body. Nice. So I'm going to go ahead and pass in request. Great. When I want to grab the data for creating this new Pokemon, um, what data do I need to actually create a new Pokemon? Or where would I grab this data from? Like, where is this user going to be sending that data to? Go ahead, Adrian. Would it be the request data? Yeah, great. So I'm going to go ahead and make data is equal to request.data.copy. All right, so now I made a copy of the request data. Now that I have that information, I want to make a new Pokemon instance uh, with valid data. What tool would help me validate the data before I actually save an entry into my database? West. I'm seeing something in the curriculum about is valid, but I'm not really sure other than that. Yeah, and it's valid. Uh, so that's a method. What does that what class does that method belong to? Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to phone a friend on that one. Yeah, go ahead. If you want to pass it off. Uh, Chris, if you know, go ahead. Um, would we use the um the serializer to verify? Yeah. So let's make um pending Pokemon. And we want to utilize the Pokemon serializer, not the model because the Pokemon serializer allows me to validate data. How could I go about validating this data? Or how do I even give this Pokemon serializer data? Would it be, um, what I did was like data equals request.data. Nice. Well, in this case, we're making a copy of the data. So what we could do is give the serializer data of the variable data which we're giving it the copy of request.data. Okay, so now that's gonna give it all the information that it needs. It's looking at all of the fields. So anything that we won't pass into it, it will utilize the default values. So now we can check if this data is valid. So how could I check this data? to make sure it's valid. And if it is valid, what kind of response should I return? Nika? Ask 
question again, please. I'm sorry. No problem. Could you say that one more time? Could you ask the question again, please? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm asking, how can I make sure that this data here in the Pokemon Serializer is actually valid, valid data? Um, wouldn't you use the is valid to make sure that you're putting it in there appropriately so you're not um so you're not polluting our database yeah that's perfect thank you so much all right so we could go ahead and say pending pokemon dot is valid that would check if it is valid and i could run a simple if statement there all right so if it is valid i want to make sure that i save it And then I want to return some sort of response, all right? Oh. Okay, and otherwise, I also want to return a response. Oh, hold on. All right. <clears throat> So what kind of response would I return if this six if this is successful? Go ahead, Nathan. Uh so we would do uh, the pending Pokemon dot data. And then with the status uh HTTP 201 created. Perfect. I created a Pokemon, so I want to make sure that I return a status code of 201 created. And what happens if this isn't valid data? What should I do in that case? Um, do the the pending Pokemon dot errors, and then return the the status equals the four hundred bad request, the HTTP four hundred bad request. Would Perfect. Would you put a Would you put an else in there, or do you need the else? Um, I don't need the else, and the right, okay, I don't need the else is because the return function would kill. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. All right, perfect. So now I've created my post method. My post method is able to create new Pokemon, but let's make sure that that works. All right, let's uh, change directory into our backend and let's run the server. All right, so our server is running. Let's bring up Thunder Client and put this to practice. If I run a get request to Pokemon, I get all of my Pokemon. We can see that that works correctly. And every, I believe almost everything has default values for my model. Let me go ahead and take a look at my model just real quick. So my model, uh, let's see, I have a default for level. I have a default for date encountered, date captured. Uh, and I do have a default for description. So it looks like every, the only thing that I need to pass in is a name in order to be able to create a new Pokemon. So let's do it. Let's go ahead and send a post request. This post request needs a body. What would go inside of this body? Go ahead, Ian's. We want all the required fields. Um, so name, um, All right. level. Did you see a different one that was required? Uh, let's see. Well, I guess we haven't made any validations on anything that's required. Yeah, it looks like everything else has a default argument. So that should be able to do the trick. Let's go ahead and create our Pokemon Mankey. I'm pretty sure that's how you spell it. Let's see how this goes. So I'm going to go ahead and send my post request. And when I send my post request, we can see that Mankey was created. Here is our name, level, the date encountered, date captured, the description, uh, this should probably be defaulted to true if we have our date captured to an actual value. So we'll change that later on. And we can see the types that come in there. All right, well, we see that the ID is seven. 
Let me go ahead and update Mankey. And what I want to update in Mankey is I want to make sure that capture is true. And I also want to make sure that types is fighting. All right, so now I'm gonna send a put request to update Mankey. Okay, looks like I got a bad request here. Um, valid data type. Uh, go ahead, Brian. I was, I was just wondering if the uppercase or lowercase matters there in the JSON. Uh, as far as for the boolean. Oh no, it has to be lowercase because it's technically JavaScript. So it's uh JSON, so it has to be lowercase. So it is coming in as true. But I'm wondering why this didn't go through. Did I not save Mankey? No, I saved Mankey. Um, and I was able to find it, but it's throwing an error in regard to the data of capture. Let me make sure that that's what I have. So I want capture to be true. And I want types to be fighting. Go ahead, Yams. Um, let's see. Is our put request under a Pokemon? Do we have to put another ID or name? Oh, we did. Okay. Yeah, we did. It's triggering the correct view, but something is making it throw an error. It's not giving me the best messages. So let's print. Maybe errors might give me something better here. Okay, so types is getting an invalid type. So that's where the error is coming from. And that likely has to do with my validators. And that's because in my validators, I don't have fighting. That's where that is coming from. So it looks like rather than returning um, error messages, I probably want to return error. Because that gives me a little bit more detailed description. All right, so fighting doesn't exist within my validator. Let's see what does exist within my validator that I can give it. Um, let's just go with unknown for demonstrational purposes. Let's go ahead and go with unknown. I send my request. Now my request comes back completed. I get all of the information regarding Mankey. We can see that it's been created, level one. It now has a true and its type is unknown. Great. So now we've created a post method that will be able to accept the request data, give that data to our serializer, validate said data, save it into our, into our uh, database, and then return the data with a 201 created response. Otherwise, it returns errors with a 400 response. Does anyone have any questions regarding the post method? All right. Doesn't seem like there are any questions. I don't see anything on the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward into our delete method. So now hosting, which is essentially creating an instance of the Pokemon class, lived at the class level. And that's why we were pinging all Pokemon. Now for deleting a Pokemon, we're going to delete a specific instance of a Pokemon. So should that live within the all Pokemon API view? or within a Pokemon API view.
Brett? Um, the A Pokemon? Yeah. Let's go ahead and place it. would go under the A Pokemon because we're deleting a specific instance. So at the very bottom of our A Pokemon class, we'll go ahead and make a new method named delete. All right, so now this delete method, this is going to do one thing and one thing only. It's going to grab that specific data, delete that one Pokemon instance, and then return an empty response. So how do we build this delete method here? George? Can you see the question one more time? All right. So this delete method is going to grab one specific Pokemon, delete that Pokemon, and then return an empty response. How do I go about building those steps? What's missing in this method to actually work as a functional base for you? I'm going to own a friend for this one. Nathan? Uh, yeah, so we're going to use our uh, get Pokemon. You know, get a Pokemon. So Pokemon equals self dot get a Pokemon and we're taking the ID. Or, yeah, we would have to add that into our um, delete method up there, right? Oh. Okay. And then you would add Pokemon dot delete next. Nice. So that gets me a Pokemon. I delete said Pokemon and I want to return an empty response. Can someone tell me what status code would allow me to return an empty response? Go ahead, James. Uh, is that the 204 no content? Perfect. So we'll go ahead and return an HTTP 204, no content. And it looks like this view is almost ready, but it's missing something. Currently, this is just working as if it were just a class method, but we want this to be a method that responds to a API request. So what argument am I missing? Go ahead, Adrian. The request. Yeah, I'm missing my request. So now I'm able to grab one Pokemon, delete said Pokemon, and return a response that is empty. All right, so let's go ahead and run a get request to Mankey. Let's make sure my server is still running. If I run that get request, I can see that Mankey still exists. Well, now if I go ahead and send a delete request, Mankey is no longer there. We can see a 204 no content that the lead request was successful. Well, if I go back to sending a get request, I get a 404 with a detail, no Pokemon matching the given query. All right. Well, what if I run all Pokemon when I send my request? Well, I know Mankey was the last Pokemon that I created. So it should be at the very bottom. But Mankey's gone. All right, there's no Pokemon matching Mankey. All right, notice that after I sent a put request to Pikachu, it put Pikachu at the very bottom, even though its ID is one. So that's something to consider as far as when you go to get all Pokemon. You don't always just want to grab dot all. Sometimes it's good to say dot order by, and you could pass in ID as the field that you wanted to order by. And now you could have Pikachu always guaranteed to be number one and so on. So if you're ever working within your React uh, development and things start going out of order when you're sending put and post requests, it's likely because you're not specifying in what order it is that you want to grab all of these Pokemon. All right. Go ahead, Adrian. Is there a predefined order that Django just default to or... Um, yeah, I guess that's my question. Sorry. 
Yeah, so Django typically will return requests with IDs being this, the main source of order. Um, the problem comes when you start sending put requests. And so we saw it earlier in Flask. There's some browsers that will try to organize data in a different format. So sometimes it's really important to use that order by function so that the browser is also tracking, hey, this has already been ordered. Do not use your default ordering um, system that you have to place data into a specific order. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Of course. All right. So now we have all of our Pokemon. We have a Pokemon. And we've built the entire crowding application to be able to create, get, update, and delete a Pokemon. Does anyone have any questions over any of these API endpoint functionalities or how we went about creating these methods? All right, if no one has any questions, let's go ahead and go over to our, oh, I see a question here. Uh, since we can order by ID, I assume we could also order by anything else too, right? That's correct. You can order by different names or different uh, different fields that you have. If you utilize name, it's going to order alphabetically. If you utilize uh, level, it's going to order by integer from lowest to highest. Same thing with date encountered. It go from the, the latest date. No, the soonest date. I apologize to the latest date. Um, description will be alphabetical. I'm not sure what would happen if you try to order by a Boolean field, uh, such as capture. I don't think they would be able to do that. Maybe let's try it out. Okay. So it looks like it goes to false first and returns all the ones that are false and then true last. If you try to sort by an integer field, I mean, by a Boolean field. Awesome. Does that answer your question, Nika? Yes, it does. All right, fantastic. So now we have all of our information. Our API is built out. We know it's working correctly. The next part is the best part of development, creating tests to make sure that we didn't break anything. So now we have our test 03, which is for updating a Pokemon. We can now write a test for deleting a Pokemon. We can utilize the same test here. So we're going to utilize response again. We're going to use a client that will now send a delete request. This delete request will utilize reverse to ping the a Pokemon URL. And the arguments it will pass will be Eevee. This Pokemon will, actually this request does not have a body. It just takes in the arguments. And after that, we can just say body is equal to JSON. Well, there's not a body, so we can say Surf self dot assert equals and know that in the new Django testing framework equals assert equals doesn't work. It's assert equal only. And what I'm going to assert that equals is that my response dot status code is the same as 204, no content. We could write this test a little bit more elaborate if we wanted to. Maybe we could do this with with subtest. We run it this way. I think that's how the syntax for subtest. I may be wrong, right? So that it ensures that the actual response was sent back correctly. But then afterwards, I want to also assert that Pokemon, oh, 
I commented that out. Dot objects. Dot all. And I could place that in some sort of length here. Is the same as the total number of Pokemon on my fixture where one is missing. So I have six. So there should be a total of five. And this way I can ensure that that Pokemon was actually deleted. Well, let's run this test and make sure it works. Say Python manage py test. I wanted to test within the Pokemon app dot test dot test views. All right, so we can see that one failed. Uh, we get an unhashable list here. And I think that's happening from this Pokemon.objects.all. Um, so let's print that. Go ahead, Brian. You might want to use the Pokemon.objects.all.count. Ah, there is a dot .count method. Nice. Let's try that. It looks like there is a dot .count method. That's great. And now if I run it, uh, I still get this unhashable list. I wonder why that's happening here. Uh, reverse Pokemon Eevee. This is happening somewhere else. Let me check it out. There it is. I forgot to pass in args inside of my reverse functionality, which is where that unhashable list was coming from. Reading that error really helped. So if I take a look at the error and I actually pay attention to what's going on, it's telling me there's a problem at testviews.py in line 40. If I looked at line 40, that's how I found that the args was missing. All right, so now I printed my count that came back as five, which is what I expected. So now I can take this off, place that there. And when I run my test, I'm checking both my status code to be 204 and for my Pokemon to have been deleted. Does anyone have any questions regarding the delete test? All right, it doesn't seem like there are any questions. So let's go ahead and test out our creating method. I'm going to go ahead and send a post or create a Pokemon. Excuse me, everyone. All right, so I'm making this create Pokemon test that's going to utilize self. I'm going to take in a response. Send a reverse request to all Pokemon. This is not going to have any arguments, but it will have a body. That body will only contain a name because all the other values are default. And I'm just going to utilize Mankey again. And then finally, I need to explain that the content type will be application slash JSON, just like we did before. All right, so now my client is going to send a post request to the URL matching the all Pokemon uh, name. If I take a look at my URLs, here's my all Pokemon name. So we'll go to the all Pokemon view. That all Pokemon view will then trigger the post request. So that's what I want to test. That's working great. Well, now again, with self.subtest, 
I want to assert. that response.status code is the same as 201. And then I can print, actually, let me go ahead and make the body. Let's make the body now, which is going to utilize json.loads, response.content. I could print the body and then I can assert Great. So let me go ahead and run the view here. Okay, it looks like everything worked. Well, rather than asserting that this view here or this print body is working correctly, what I'm going to do is I'm not even going to interact with this. What I want to check is that the body or that the number of Pokemons actually increased. So now I'm going to go ahead and say, that what I want to check will be Pokemon.objects.all.count be the same as six. And now we can see that all three of my tests passed. I was able to delete a Pokemon, and then I was able to create that Pokemon again to have a total of six Pokemon. All right. This create method is exactly the same thing as our um, Thunder client request. We're just specifying that we're going to use application JSON. We utilize subtests to make sure that we're returning a 201 status code. And then we're asserting the count of all the Pokemon within the test database to ensure that it incremented to six. At this point, does anyone have any questions over how to create tests for delete or create methods? Go ahead, Yant. Um, what was the reason why we were able to use test three twice? Oh, I see. Why well, utilize zero three twice? Uh, that was my mistake. Uh, I should have incremented the numbers. Um, but as far as why the tests were able to run correctly, it's because Python just checks that the name is actually different. I could have the same exact name, and as long as one character is different, it will recognize them as two separate tests. Okay, so the test underscore, that's the only keyword that it checks for? Correct, yes. Test underscore must be maintained at the beginning of every single function. That's an actual test. Uh, but the naming convention afterwards, as long as there's one character difference in between all the names, it will recognize it as a separate test. Okay, thank you. Of course. All right, and then just to make sure that works, we run our test alias again, and it works correctly with all three of my tasks passing. Go ahead, Lewis. This one's more just like general curiosity, but the status codes that we assign um, are CRUD methods. Uh, do they have to be accurate? Like, will it throw an error if I put a, if I'm doing a uh, create a Pokemon, I put a, let's say a 204, is it gonna be like, hey, like, can you use this status method with this, the status with this method basically, or uh, could you just accidentally mess it up? I'm just curious for like testing purposes too. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for 204, the 204 will throw an error if you try to pass a body in the response. I don't think it will throw an error, but it, the response just won't get processed. Uh, let me try it out actually. Uh, where is, what am I looking for? Wait, wait. All right, let's uh, go ahead and try it out here. Here's 204 and let's say, let's say a Pokemon was deleted. I'm gonna go ahead and run my server. Bring up Thunder Client. I'm going to create Mankey yet again. Let me make sure my body is still there. Oh, it is not. Let 
Um, name Nike four hundred by request. Okay, what's the issue here? Um, Should it need to be in title format? Yep, perfect. Right there, it says name needs to be in title format. All right. So let's run Mankey. Okay, there it is, the 201 created. If I utilize Mankey now and I run a get request, we can see that in the response, I actually have Mankey being created. Now let me go ahead and run a delete method. So it tells me a Pokemon was deleted and it still gave me a 204 no content. So it looks like the status codes won't throw an error. There's no sort of validation as far as the status codes being corresponding, uh, but developers do expect this, these status codes as common practice for RESTful API design. Does that answer your question, Lewis? It does, yeah, thanks for the demonstration. Of course, yeah, no problem at all. All right, it doesn't seem like there are any other questions. So today what we covered was what is CRUD, the CRUD API design, the status codes that correspond to each individual method, why to utilize the request body rather than utilizing URL params, implementing the put method, testing the put view, and then writing the post delete methods and testing both the post and the delete methods. At this point, does anyone have any questions over anything that we covered today? All right, it doesn't seem like there are any questions. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.